This week, Ireland lost a hero. Derry lost a son. Sinn Féin lost a leader. And I lost a dear friend and a comrade. But Martin's family has suffered the biggest loss of all. They have lost a loving, caring, dedicated husband, father and grandfather, a brother and an uncle. So on behalf of Sinn Féin, on my own behalf, and on Clet's behalf, and on behalf of our family, and on all of your behalfs, I extend our solidarity to all of the McGuinness clan. We also thank the doctors and the nurses who looked after Martin so well during his illness. And we thank and pray also for the family of Rand McBride, and we send our sympathy to them and to all in the world of Irish soccer. One of the very best things Martin ever did was to marry Bernie Canning. And one of his very best achievements was the family which he and Bernie reared in the bogside in Derry. And above all else, Martin loved his family. So our heart goes out to Bernie, to their sons Fakra, Emmett, their daughters Fanula and Grania, Bernie and Martin's grandchildren, Tiernan and Oisin Rasa, Kena Kara Dulta Ogasaiv, to his sister Geraldine who looked after him in bad times, to his brothers Paul, William, Declan, Tom and John, and to all the wider McGuinness family. And all of us who knew Martin are proud of his achievements, of his humanity, of his compassion, he was a formidable person. He did extraordinary things in extraordinary times. He would not be surprised at some of the commentary from some quarters recently about him and his life. He would be the first to say that these people are entitled to their opinions, particularly those who suffered at the hands of the IRA. But let me take issue with those in the editorial rooms or in the political ivory towers who denounce Martin McGuinness as a terrorist. <laughs> Mara Dirt and Pearshock at the grave of another Fenian. The fools, the fools, the fools. Martin cannot answer them back, so let me answer for him. Martin McGuinness was not a terrorist. <laughs> Martin McGuinness was a freedom fighter. He was also a political prisoner, a negotiator, a peacemaker, a hater. And while he had a passion for politics, he was not one-dimensional. He had many interests. He was interested in nature, in spirituality, and he was famously, hugely interested in people. He also enjoyed storytelling. He could tell a yarn better than most, including me. And in the early weeks of his illness after Christmas, I tried to encourage him to write a book. And he was up for that. None of the two of us realized just how seriously, we knew how seriously ill he was, but none of us predicted the outcome. But he was up for writing a book, a book about childhood summers in Donegal, in the alleys outside Bonkrana, about his mother, his memories of his father, his brothers and sisters, school days, much more, meeting Bernie, their courtship, the births of their children, their grandchildren. Unfortunately, he will never write that book. He was a good writer. He was a decent poet, with a special place in his heart for Seamus Heaney and Patrick Kavanagh. He loved growing herbs. He thought he was the world's best chess player. 
He loved cooking, fly fishing, walking, especially round Greenland Fort, Greenland and Ayak. When she salt a gak sort sport of Nero Pelador, ni na masa na e ariu. He enjoyed watching sports of all kinds, football, hurling, cricket, golf, rugby, soccer. He was the world's worst soccer player. <laughs> he once broke his leg playing soccer. He had a plaster, you remember Bernie? He had a plaster from his ankle to his hip. And he had to go up the stairs on his backside and down the stairs on his backside. And then two or three days later, he discovered that he'd also broken his arm. <laughs> I could never figure that out. <laughs> his mother, Peggy, God rest her, told me that he tripped over the ball. <laughs> Mommy's bring you down. <laughs> he was great at telling jokes. He liked all of these activities. But he especially loved having the space to have time with Bernie and their family. And that's what grounded Martin McGuinness. Be Martin and a car more, I could shoot a leg, I be a trench or sun in the shear or fud and dawn. Martin was also a friend to those engaged in struggles for justice across the globe. He travelled widely, he promoted the imperative of peacemaking in the Basque country, and I want to welcome our friends from the Basque country here today. He travelled to Colombia, to the Middle East, to Iraq, and I want to welcome the Palestinian ambassador here today. And I want to welcome the ambassador of Cuba here today also. He traveled to South Africa to meet Nelson Mandela and others in the ANC leadership, as well as in the National Party, to learn from their experience. But he was also a man, in many, many ways, who was very ordinary. He was particularly very ordinary in his habits and in his personal lifestyle. He wasn't the slightest bit materialistic. Like many other Derry Wands, Martin grew up in a city in which Catholics were the victim of widespread political and economic discrimination. He was born into an orange state which did not want him or his kind. Poverty was endemic. I remember him telling me that he was surprised to learn that his father, a quiet, modest, church-going man, marched in the civil rights campaign here in Derry. And the Orange State's violent suppression of that civil rights campaign, the Battle of the Bogside, and the emerging conflict propelled Martin into a life less ordinary. Bull Midgen Shaw, Dunkhead Ur, blamed the father O'Hen, a Dara seer. Is Karja or his comrade Magina Ocean. Martin and I first met 45 years ago behind the barricades in Free Derry. We have been friends and comrades ever since. From time spent on the run to imprisoned in Mountjoy, in the Curra, in Port Leash, in Belfast Prison through his time as Northern Education Minister and later Deputy First Minister, along with Ian Paisley, and then Peter Robinson, and then Arlene Foster, Martin made a non-paralleled journey. And reading and watching some of the media reports of his life and death in recent times, one could be forgiven for believing that Martin, at some undefined point in his life, had a road to Damascus conversion, that he abandoned his Republican principles, that he abandoned his former comrades in the Irish Republican Army, and that he joined the political establishment. And to suggest this is to miss the truth of his leadership and the essence of his humanity. There was not a bad Martin McGuinness, or indeed a good Martin McGuinness. 
There was simply a man, like every other decent man or woman, doing their best in very difficult circumstances. Martin believed in freedom. He believed in equality. And he resisted, by armed actions, those who withheld these rights and any help to shape conditions in which, was, in which it was possible to advocate for these entitlements by unarmed strategies. And throughout it all, Martin remained committed to the same ideals that led to him becoming a Republican activist in the first instance. He believed that the British government's involvement in Ireland, in Ireland, in the partition of our island, are the root causes of our difficulties and of our divisions. And he was absolutely 150% about that. The British government has no right in Ireland, never had any right in Ireland, and will never have any right whatsoever to have any involvement in Ireland. Along with others of like mind, he understood the importance of building a popular, democratic, radical Republican party across this island. He especially realized that negotiations and politics are another form of struggle. And in this way, he helped chart a new course, a different strategy. And this involved taking difficult initiatives to make political advances. Our political objectives, our Republican principles, our ideals did not change. On the contrary, those guided us through every twist and turn and will continue to guide us through every twist and turn of this process. Thanks to Martin, we now live in a very different Ireland, an Ireland which has changed utterly. We live in a society in transition. The future can now be decided by us. It should never be decided for us. Without Martin, there could not have been the type of peace process we've had. Much of the change which we now take for granted, and people sometimes say to me, the young ones take it for granted, and I say to them, that's good. That's a good thing. Much of this could not have been achieved without Martin McGuinness. And in my view, the key is in never giving up. And that was Martin's mantra also. He was also tough, assertive, and unmovable when that was needed. He was even dogmatic at times. Wimps don't make good negotiators. Neither do so-called hard men. Martin learned the need for flexibility. And his contribution to the evolution of Republican thinking was enormous, as was his work in popularizing Republican ideals. And over many years, and it wasn't all work, and there was adventures and crack and fun and laughs and tears along the way, both of us realized that advances in struggle require creativity, require imagination, and a willingness to take initiatives. And Martin embraced that challenge. And he didn't just talk about change, he delivered change. He once said, when change begins, and we have the confidence to embrace it as an opportunity and a friend, and to show honest and positive leadership, then so much is possible. Both Fiche in an upper, more broad ogham, John Martin, uh, ah, New Mar and Ked, Ira Atticus, and Ye Co Unto Enya Nahasta. It was a source of great pride for me following the Good Friday Agreement to nominate Martin as the North's Minister for Education. It was a position he embraced, putting equality and fairness into practice in the Department of Education, seeking to end the 11 plus to improve outcomes for children and to bring about the most radical overhaul of our education system since partition. 
In 2007, he became Deputy First Minister and an equal partner to Ian Paisley in government. And they did forge a friendship that illustrated to all the progress that we have made on the island of Ireland. And his reconciliation and his outreach work and his work on behalf of victims and for peace in Ireland and internationally have been widely applauded. As part of that work, Martin met Queen Elizabeth of England several times. He did so very conscious of the criticism that this might provoke. He was the first to acknowledge that some Republicans and Nationalists were discommoded at times by his efforts to reach out the hands of friendship. But that's the real test. And if we are to make peace with our unionist neighbours, we have to reach out. And the real test of leadership is to reach out beyond your own base. It's a test that Martin passed every time. Some unionist leaders were discommoded also at the sight of their Queen meeting our Martin, or on another occasion using a couple of fuckle, or bowing in salute to the men and women of 1916. These are symbolic gestures, but they're important nonetheless. As Martin pointed out in his letter of resignation on January the 9th, the equality Mutual respect and all Ireland approaches enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement have never been fully embraced by the DUP. Apart from the negative attitude to nationalism and to the Irish identity and culture, there has been a shameful disrespect towards many other sections of our community. I quote this more in sadness than in anger. I try to understand why this is so. That's what Martin did. So here, at this graveside of this good man, let me appeal to our unionist neighbours. Let us learn to like each other, to be friends, to celebrate and enjoy our differences, and to do so on the basis of common sense, respect and tolerance for each other and everyone else as equals. Let me appeal also to nationalists and republicans, do nothing to disrespect our unionist neighbours or anyone else. Yes, stand against bigotry, stand up for your rights, stand against sectarianism, but respect our unionist neighbours. Reach out to them, lead as Martin led by example, by little acts of kindness and generosity. It's Fager Lena Ave Untak Brodowal as Martin. It's Dina Aid and the Fear August the Munra Untak Chin, a Shas and Fud or Son Searsha Naharan. We can be proud of Martin, the huge attendance here today, and I want to welcome friends from across this entire island and from England, Scotland, and Wales, from Canada, from Australia, Australia and from the United States of America. That's all indications of the love and respect that Martin was held in. Why is this so? It's because he was another of those great and remarkable men and women who stood up for Irish freedom and for what they believed to be right. And he believed that a better Ireland, a genuinely new Ireland, is possible. He rejected any suggestion that gender or race or class or skin colour, or disability, or sexual orientation, or religion should exclude citizens from their full rights and entitlements. And that's the legacy which we have to build upon. Of course, while much progress has been made, not least in the numerous lives saved in the last 20 years, nevertheless, Irish Republicans know that a long, long road with many twists and turns still lies ahead. It's all about rights. Human rights, religious rights, language rights, LGBT rights, social and economic rights, rights for women, national rights, the rights and the right to freedom. 
and these rights can't be left to any political party. If you want an act Nagilga, get out and campaign for it. Don't sit back, get out and work for it. <laughs> now, Hapare Johnny, if you want a Bill of Rights, campaign for that. If you want marriage equality, mobilize, get on the streets, demand it. If you want freedom, go out and take your freedom. Freedom for everyone. Organize, mobilize, unite for your rights. That's the challenge facing us to build a mass movement for positive change across all 32 counties of our island and for all our people. And facing that challenge, we're stronger because of Martin. So don't mourn, celebrate, organize. That's what Martin would want. He exemplified all that is decent and fair about our Republican ideology and our core values of freedom, equality, and solidarity. So it's now over to us to take the struggle from where he has left it. Like Bobby Sands, he believed that our revenge should be the laughter of our children. By his example, he showed us He showed us that it's possible to build peace out of conflict, to build a fairer and a better and more equal future, and to build unity out of division. And Martin will continue to inspire and to encourage us in the time ahead. I never thought for one moment that I would be giving this oration here today. Martin was looking forward so much to stepping down from public office in May. He was looking forward to it every day that passed. Not to step back from activism, but to step back from the rigors of that particular position. This wasn't to be, but his was a life well lived. Now, none of this is any consolation to Bernie and to her clan. But we pray that she and they, in the time ahead, will take comfort from the happy times they enjoyed with Martin. He said Bernie was his rock many times during his illness. My rock of casual, he told me. I'm lucky to have her. And Bernie was also lucky to have him. But so were the rest of us. We also loved him. He will be missed by many, but Bernie will miss him more than anyone else. So farewell, Martin. Slan Akara. Slan Gojo. We thank Martin McGuinness. He was a rebel. Up the rebels. We salute Martin McGuinness. We applaud Martin McGuinness. He was a Republican up the Republic. Go to Mila, my over.